Welcome to Discover Books, the podcast and YouTube channel where we let the stories live on by interviewing authors and doing book reviews, where we discover the stories behind the stories by digging in with the authors, not only to learn about the book, but to learn more about the author. Please join us on an adventure of discovery and don't forget to subscribe to our page. Welcome to Discover Books, the story behind the story. Tonight, we welcome Denise Frisnio. Well, I just blew it, but go ahead and say it. Frisino. Frisino. <laughs> Denise and I have known each other for a while, and Denise is actually author of three books, three of my favorite historical fiction books right now. And I will put a plug in later that I'm still waiting for the next book, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, we welcome her today. She kind of started this whole podcast series. She's the one that encouraged me to reach out to self-published and indie published authors. I met her right after I started my job here at Discover Books, and we've been talking since. And for some reason, I haven't had the opportunity to interview her yet. But as you can see, she's won several awards for these books, and she is quite accomplished. And as a historical fiction fan and a fan of World War II books, these are some of my favorites. They cover things I've never heard about before. Why? get entertaining and the character development is very strong. So we're going to get right into it and kind of learn a little bit about Denise and how she came to write these books. And we're going to focus more on Orchids of War and Storms from a Clear Sky because we're going to be coming up on Pearl Harbor Day really quickly. And she focuses on that, especially in Orchids of War. So Denise, go ahead and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you came to write these books. Thanks, Shannon. Hi. Yes, I'm Denise Frisino. I've you know, I didn't, I wasn't a writer to begin with. Um, I was an actress. I did a lot of theater since I was five. I did, was on stage and everything. So I didn't think writing was my thing, except for stage or commercials or things of that sort. And all of a sudden, I find myself in front of the computer all the time in my basement. No applause. Thank you very much from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and just working silently alone. And it's been a challenge at times because it's so different than being having that immediate feedback from being on theater. But I find that the characters talk to me all the time and tell me what they want in the book. And it's really not up to me what's going on, but it, they're really writing it themselves. So the first book, which is Orchids of War. No, excuse me. That's, one's, that's this one over here. Yep. I'm talking about Whiskey Cove, which was the yep. first one. When I was young, I worked up at Roach Harbor in the San Juan Islands between Canada and Washington State. And a friend had told me that his grandmother had been involved in prohibition. Now think about a woman being highly involved in prohibition. I said, oh, honey, no, 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 no. Well, then I came home and I, I was talking to my father, who was a journalist. So that's why I see I didn't think I was a writer. And he said, no, write the story. Well, when I was researching for that book, this gentleman told me about a young woman right before the war broke out, who was at the University of Washington, who was fluent in Japanese, but she was Caucasian. So the FBI found out about her talent, so to speak, and they dressed her like a hooker, put her in the bars of San Francisco and had her listen to the conversations to help the FBI determine where the Japanese espionage spy ring was from Alaska to Mexico. Well, I, I sat on that for a while, I thought, well, let's 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 wait on that one but sure enough i started doing research and i've spent 11 years now interviewing over 56 men and women from world war ii and if you go to my web page you'll see some of those interviews i have up and i have pictures of them wonderful 11 years i've been at this and so then what I did was I took what they told me happened to them, what their experiences were during the war, and I weave it into my characters so that the story is lively, it is character driven, it is factual for the most part. Even though it's historical fiction, it's extremely factual. I spent a lot of time doing research, reading books like At Dawn We Slept and things of that real historical thick. <laughs> not entertaining books you know so that's that's how that developed and I thought oh I'll get it done in one book well orchids only goes from up to 1941 till December 7th of 1941 and explains about some of the spies 
The second one, I thought, well, I'll get it done in the second book. Nope. Storms from a Clear Sky has so much research in it that it only goes to 1943. And as Shannon alluded to, book three is totally in the works. Very strong. I'm getting, you'd be happy to hear, doing a lot of work on that. Just got back from another trip to Hawaii doing more research. Um, and it will take from 1943 to the end of the war. So that's that's how I've done it, is, is I've used actual people's stories, veterans of World War II, to I embellish my character's activities. Well, and let's talk about some of those stories, because you've told me about a few of them, how you just kind of get put in the right place at the right time with all these books. And you've told me about some of your trips to Hawaii and being able to stand at the very place where, um, the, was it the operator, the commander was standing when um Pearl Harbor was hit is that correct do I have yes that? yes I, I I you're right I have been blessed with so many miracles uh writing this book that's why I know that they were meant to be written um during Pearl Harbor um the the total commander of, of Pearl and of course now his name is going to elude me so I'll, I will come back <laughs> I know. To it's eluding me Oops. right now too <laughs> <laughs> oh I'll think of him I mean, you know he was the, the hot man on he took he took he went down for it anyway when he was he rushed in and he was standing at his window and what happened was a bullet from one of the airplanes or something penetrated his window and he was where he had his glass case right here over his heart and it went into his glass case and it's the bullet and it stopped the bullet and he said i wished i had died with my men well Years later, when I was doing research, I was very lucky to have a submarine commander be able to take me into the very building and the Commodore of all of the Pacific fleet allowed me to come into the command that room and stand at the very window where he was um, during Pearl Harbor, where, where he was shot. Now I'm going to look like a knucklehead for not remembering his name right now. <laughs> Oh, it will come back to me. <laughs> that That's was book one. That was, that was years ago. I didn't send you a list of questions to prepare you. We just make That's this okay. an open dialogue. It, it, so. it, it always does. <laughs> yeah. That's hysterical. And I love that story. And I love how you, because you've been there and you've stood in these places and you researched so well and you have visualized, and I think it's part of your acting coming out, your stage and theater skills you really paint the picture very well, not just the people and the character development, but the surroundings. And when I was reading, I was amazed at how much I was transported to the locations. And now I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so not really hard for me to picture some of these things, but you put me into the story and that that's a really tough skill, but I think it's because you have interviewed so many of these people. You're telling these people stories. And even though you've developed your own characters out of many people, you know it really well. Okay, now you can't remember the guy's name, but you know those stories so well. And they're and so I, deep. I, I, I was tempted, like, let's grab our phone. And, but my phone's off because I don't want it to go on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Let me text this because he's. I, know, I was going to turn around and grab my book and see if I can find it real quick because. Um, oh my gosh, it's just so embarrassing. And it's Hold all on. good, but but it's beside the point because names are like that, but the stories stay with us. And this is such an important story. And it's so important for us to remember what happened and how it happened. And I want to talk a little bit about your views on this part of history and how it has touched you and what importance you think it still has today. We have such an oh. emphasis on World War II stories lately i mean for the last couple of years they've just been pouring out and sadly i feel like some of it's because finally not finally that's the wrong word a lot of those people that fought have passed on and they never told their stories but their children and they their grandchildren not. are uncovering them and want to tell these stories these heroic stories um and i just really appreciate the fact that you dug into it you know, you hit on a point. What I would, what I would always do is, I would not allow Kimmel, Kimmel, Kimmel was okay, his name. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, this is this is hysterical. He insisted that all of them. This is something I learned from one of the men. 
he, who was stationed um, at Kani Ohi, which was the other, the uh, where the, the Japanese came in as well. They came in Kani Ohi and they came in to Pearl and they came up over Hickman. But um, Kimmel would insist his men wear a cap, their caps. So they called them Kimmels. They'd say, grab your Kimmel, we're going out. He really wanted, well, it was probably a sun thing too in Hawaii because a lot of them. And do you know what else was fascinating to learn? Before Pearl, Captain Dick McNeese, who was the first man shot at Kaneo, he told me, um, he was a PBY pilot over there. And I, one of my characters does what happened to Captain Dick McNeese, right? But he told me that before Pearl, they only worked till one o'clock. Oh, wow. They were encouraged to swim exercise and you know stay in shape but that's how lax they were one o'clock they got their duty was over and wow. boy did that that did that change in an instant right yeah so uh, that that was one of the things but I was I stood in in uh, Kimmel's office where he was hit and um it what these men have told me though and women that I've interviewed I would never allow any of their family members near they had to be alone because they wouldn't talk in front of a family member. They wouldn't talk about their first kill, what they really saw, what they really did in the war. They really never really wanted their family to know how brutal it was for them and the suffering that they actually went through. Um, now, my father served in World War II and asked me if I had the wherewithal. Of course, he had passed by the time I was really into this, but no. All I know was he was on the Alcan during when the war first broke out in fact he was already in this this happened as well to a lot of men and women they were already in the service and the war broke out my dad said he did four years of overtime because he was just about to be <laughs> be released yes. from, from service so he did four years of overtime and so he was on the alcan built you know freezing in the alaska winter <laughs> to build that road so the first the quickest built road built and mm -hmm. very very valuable road to get up to Alaska from um, very important. And then they sent him to Burma. So he was on the Burma road for two and a half years. That's a changing climate in, in the jungle. <laughs> so he went from the ice to this, to, you know, snakes in his tent, literally. Ugh. I thought, but they, they didn't want to talk and the wives would be mad at me because they would have nightmares. Right. But for some, it was very cathartic and they, felt a sense of release some of them had never been interviewed i met a lieutenant colonel who was on the backup list for the norman Berg, you know, trials because he was one of the first ones there mm. and he had never spoken to anyone he had never told his story a lieutenant colonel There's and it was so you know them. and there are there most of them are gone almost all of them are gone that i've interviewed and my interviews are about three hours long. So what I am doing, which is really fun, is I have all of this tape, most of it's videotape that I am working on. And um, I got the the uh, World War II interviews.com. No one had it. Wow. So I'm extremely hard. When I'm done with the book, <laughs> the third book, because <laughs> I'm going to be putting all sections of those interviews up. And like I said, I have about 47 of them. Wow. So, and that, you know, that's part of my project. That is. Then it's children's huge. books all the way, honey. I'm tired of the war. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at this 11 years longer than the war itself, you know? So it's, yeah. and it's, it's really something to think about. And I'm glad you've enjoyed these books because I did go for portions of the war that people have never heard about, mm -hmm. you know? And what, I think that's what has been so powerful to me is to not understand. We we always hear about certain parts of the war and then there's parts that I still have yet to have a lot of exposure to. Um, and this was definitely one of them and making sense out of some of the things that happened in America at the time and how things happen. It's not always easy to hear about these things and about why things happen, but it's very important to tell the truth. And to get the yes. truth out there and yet move on from it and say, it's over. That part's over. We just need to guard against, you know, anything happening now. And I mean, there was atrocities across every country committed atrocities during the war. And that's the saddest part. 
but I really want to get into your character development here. And I'm looking real quick because I'm like, oh my gosh, the characters are so strong. And now my mind is going blank on what their names are, but you're going to help me. So it's Kimmel. Jack. Their name's Kimmel. No, I'm just Kim kidding. Oh, <laughs> Billy is my, my um, woman. That's right. Billy and Jack. And Jack. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Billy and Jack. And so you've got a little bit of a romance thing going on yeah. here, which is interesting and fun. And um, so talk to me a little bit about how you developed the characters and how that process worked for you. Well, don't let anyone tell, fool you. You write about what you know about, you know. And so a lot of my characters are conglomerates of several people. Um, and Billy is just wild and and wonderful, in my opinion, because she she's outspoken. She wants to she really wants to be a part of helping. And a lot of the women did. A lot of the women did not sit around and do nothing. They were out collecting pots and pans. You know, they were, they were packaging things to ship overseas or they joined a branch of the service. And um, I, w I mentioned the spars in one of my books. Oops, spoiler alert. The spars <laughs> were... <laughs> The, coast, the women of the Coast Guard, and they only existed during World War II. So you had wax waves and, and spars. Um, and they were, like I said, to relieve the men of the Coast Guard on our shores so that those men could go pilot the boats for the Navy. Now, that's a little fact that nobody talks about, is the, the Coast Guard was kind of usurped into the Navy and the Navy gets the credit and you hardly ever hear <laughs> anything about the Coast Guard, but they were, they were manning the ships for the Navy. And so, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot of, everyone worked together. So Billy, I loved, I just loved developing her because she, she was, you know, she has to be very strong, but she has to have a lot of fear and, uh, and tragedy. So what I did with Billy, because this is about the Japanese spies, along our West Coast, right? Mm -hmm. And the, this first book is five years of research. Orchids of War is five years. This one's nine, Storms from a Clear Sky. Mm -hmm. So, because um, if I'm gonna write about this, you're correct, I better get it right. So um, what I did was I made Billy's best friend, Eileen, be Japanese and Billy be so in love with the Japanese culture because remember, it's a beautiful culture. Yes. Uh, you know, problem being was that they're, emperor was seen as their god and if he said you die you die you know yep. and that was one of the the tragic things there just was no black or white there um they were they did as they were told but the culture was so beautiful that billy was totally enamored with it and very familiar with it and that's what made her such a good if you will spy for america now remember everybody had spies yep. in fact in the bible it says the two oldest professions are <laughs> Bookers and spies. And spies. So, <laughs> take your choice. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so that that made it more, uh, gave it another depth because she does not want to turn on her best friend. And then in walks Jack. Jack, who's surly and doesn't really give a darn about anybody, except finding these you know his goal find the spies and especially one in particular Akio who he has um a history with and you know just pure hatred between the two of them so that's another layer of element that you that I added in there so and, which makes it totally engaging and I love the I mean I love the fact that the first one ended and you're like wait where's the second one and luckily I could get the second one right away. And now it's been a few years and I'm waiting for the third one, but I'm really excited. I mean, I know how this, I know how the war ends, but I don't know how the relationship and things like that end. And I think I'm kind of excited to see how Billy comes through this because in real life, the women struggled after the war, they were sent back home and it was difficult. Yes. They had such roles in the the war and we see a lot of stories coming out about the women and I can't imagine how hard that would be to have such a purpose not that home's not a purpose you know and that doesn't have its own goals correct but to be doing something for your country and so patriotic and then to be told yeah you've got to go back home and kitchen yep and you've you <laughs> kind of see pregnant in the kitchen again 
And it, it's kind of interesting because then you see in society how Hollywood handled that and all the TV shows. I love Lucy. All these things were kind of based on let's make women feel important again. Let's make this part of our society again and show women that it's okay. But a lot of the TV shows were there to promote Donna Reed, um, Leave It to Beaver. All those were trying to, to show how important this was and that it's okay to be at home, which was great and culturally was great. But it's really interesting when you take that and put it those TV shows into context with history and realize women were really struggling. And then they put these oh, yes. shows out to answer those those questions and to try to answer that call to women saying, look, be this perfect wife and all will be well. And that's that's an interesting thing. So I'm, I'm really curious to see how Billy comes out of the war and what happens. And I don't even know if you know how that's happening yet. I mean, if you're still well, writing. She's telling me, believe me, she's she's got my ear. But, <laughs> you know, that's a really good point because that even my own mother, she said it was extremely difficult because suddenly she not only did she not have a job, but she didn't have any of her income, <clears throat> excuse me, of her income. You know, she had to rely on my father. And after I was children, she finally went back to work and she loved it. But, you know, I it it was a hard time. And I and I think that there was um, the fifties, you think about the fifties and you, you think of the women and you think of a cocktail in there. Yeah. yeah. You know, yep. you do. And a cigarette in the other, possibly, you know, they're perfectly um, coiffed and, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And pearls. Come on. Don't forget the yep, pearls. The pearls. Yep. And, and, and totally perfect when it really was, you're right about what, how it was being portrayed. But ironically now I love Lucy. She was running the show, you know, she and Desi. She was. So um, they were very, very, she was very active in that. But yes. women, have, they were, it was a setback. It, it was, was a set, you was. know, in a sense. Yeah. And so. I, you know, it's a very important thing to put all history together and see how it balances out and how it comes out in the end. And we've come a long way, but it, it's, it's really fascinating. I do want to pivot back and talk a little bit about some of your awards that you won because you've got quite a few of them. And I, I'm not surprised because the books are incredible, but why don't you talk well, about a, a few of them, what they mean and how you won them and which books won the awards. Some of them are finalists, like the Nancy Pearl. If you know who Nancy Pearl is out there, the viewers, she is our librarian who has turned what radio, would you call her a radio? Uh, and she has a list of the best books. I was one of three finalists in hers, but the, and the big one is the Hemingway. That one I won first place. Hemingway's 20th century wartime fiction, Storms from a Clear Sky, just won that one. So that's kind of fun. And the NIE is the Look National Independent. Yeah, yeah thank, you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Well, it was it was thrilling. Um, it just shows that nine years of work was paying off, yes. you know. But it it is, and you know, as a writer, to those of you who are aspiring writers, and I please, I hope a lot of you are out there. Um, these are important things to enter and to try for because, you know, who knows if you're going to win or not, but at least you have something, something to um, aspire to. And it gives you a sense of, of what is going on in the writing world out there. So um, don't be afraid to ever <laughs> to, to, but be careful. Some of them, they're after the research. money, whether, yeah. you know, vet them make sure they're worth worth your dime because you work very hard for your dime as an author you work yes, you very, very hard. yeah and so and that's how denise and i kind of met she was out promoting her book in oh, yeah. my town and i walked by and was like oh caught my eye and we started talking and then we sat down for lunch and i had just started working times. at discover books yep and she told me how hard it was i was kind of clueless to how little authors make off their books after all the time and research put in and how indie publish and self-publish really struggled to get their name out there. And I thought I can have a somewhat of a solution to some of that and give a little boost up and at no cost. And that was one of the biggest things was how can I do this and not have a cost? It, it helps us and it helps them. And it's this symbiotic relationship and it's been really fun to get to know so many authors and I just have to appreciate Denise and applaud her for 
kind of given me the insights um, because it really did kind of start this and change the way I looked at what I did in marketing every day and gave me more of a purpose rather than just, you know, here's a new book, here's a new book and all the big titles, um, looking at some of those self-published and indie published books. And it's been, it's been a thrilling adventure to do this. And of course I expanded out to podcast and uh, haven't done many yet, but and we're glad on. you did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And um. One you know, thing. can I say something yep, to that? Absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. You know, you're absolutely right because when I first published Whiskey Cove, this one over mm -hmm. here, um, I'm here to tell you, people would not, this was 14 years ago, I think. People would not touch it because it was, oh, it was self-published. You see, and so we have come a long ways now because more people are self-publishing. Which is good because let me tell you, it, with a traditional publish, publish, uh, publisher, um, it's years. You know, it's years in the making. And so if you, for example, this book, I did all this research on it and it had been written, but I, it was sitting on a shelf. And our local historian, Paul Dorpat, up here in the Northwest, who has several um, history books out on, on, on our Northwest, calls me one day and he goes, Denise, where's that book you wrote on prohibition? I said, it's around here on a shelf somewhere, Paul. And he said, get it out. <laughs> Ken Burns is doing a, a thing on prohibition. And I told everybody at channel nine that you were our expert. And I'm like, thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to rush. I didn't have two years to wait for, you know, an editor to do their thing and to get it out. I needed to get it out. So I decided I would learn the business myself and I would self-publish. And um, it's still one of my best sellers. And it's a great story. And, you know, who knows? Maybe every author's dream was would be it's picked up, you know, to for a, a movie. Why not? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that that's still, there's still some rumblings. But it, it, it was my, so I caught my first child, my first child, and it was a real learning experience. So you should not be afraid. But again, if you're going to self-publish, do your homework, because there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, I'll publish for you. Uh, give me 10,000 or whatever. You know, yeah. no, you don't have to do it that way. Um, talk to local authors, go to events like Shannon did and find your authors and ask questions. You know, we, we should be helping each other. Like she said, it's a symbiotic relationship. We need readers and uh, we need an audience, but we should be helping young writers or young meaning young at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can write at any age yes. and we should be helping each other to uh, achieve a dream. I love that. And I have, Denise has been a really good advocate pushing me to write my book, which I haven't done yet. But um, it will come one day. And so Denise has been, she really supports it. And there's such a community here in my, where I live of self-published authors. And it's been great to see them thrive. And I've interviewed several of them now. But okay, so Denise, let's get into some of your spies and some of the situations that you've got information on that probably nobody's heard about. Um, and tell us about some of your favorite stories. Well, earlier we were talking about miracles, how some of them happen and how I know that this story should be written. Um, and this one is a, I was, when I do research, I love to stand where I'm going to write. So um, on one time, December 7th, when it fell in 2014, when it fell on a Sunday, my husband and I went over to Hawaii and I stood above Connie Ohi because that's where one of my characters is. And I watched, you know, at 7.55, I watched the water, the waves. I watched where the moon was over the Pauli, where, which they said brought the Japanese planes in, that they were got, could be guided by that. And I was when I was there, I, I um, went to, this is not about the spy one, but I'll get to that one. I went to the market. My husband said, now this woman here has the best cinnamon rolls, honey. <laughs> so I'm standing there and I'm looking at this Hawaiian woman and I said, you know, I'm so mad at myself. I don't know why I said this. I said, I'm so mad at myself. Do you know, I have all these interviews set up here, but what I really need is I need someone, a woman who was an entertainer during World War II, who is Portuguese, Hawaiian, Japanese. And <laughs> she looks at me and she says, 
My mother is Portuguese Hawaiian and entertained for the troops during World War II. Would you like to meet her? And there I was sitting with this beautiful woman who was with Carl Reiner entertaining for the troops on Oahu. And actually they took her to um, LA for a while, but that's the kind of miracle. So then I'll go back uh, years later and I am off of Hanapepe because that is coming up very strongly in book three, um, Hanapepe on Kauai. And we went on the Blue Dolphin, which is a boat that takes you along the coast. And I'm standing at the railing, you know, and I've got my little, my Kimmel on, my cap on, you know, and <laughs> I'm looking at the shore. And this huge Hawaiian, really big guy comes standing, he's part of the crew. And he comes, he says, are you okay? Because it was rough water and some people were not doing well on the boat. I said, I'm fine. But that over there, Barking Sands, was that ever, you know, Coast Guard or was that always Army or was that always Navy? He goes, oh no, that's always been Navy. That, but he says, behind me over here is an island. And he said, and um, Niahau. And I said, oh yeah, the Niahau incident. Well, then I began to tell him about what I knew about the Niihau incident and what had happened on the day of Pearl Harbor. The Japanese had been told, if you are in trouble, you uh, fly and land on Niihau. It's flat, it's level, nobody's living on there and we'll come from Sunday Saturday Marine and we'll pick you up. Don't you worry about a thing. So this Japanese pilot does that, but he goes to land and he runs right into a wall because there were real Hawaiians. This island was owned by the Robinsons and occupied only by true Hawaiian blood Hawaiians, except for three Japanese. So he hit his plane hits and flips over, hits a wall, flips over, and he's knocked out. Well, one of the Hawaiians runs up. Now, remember, there's no radio com communication. Pearl Harbor is happening. All of this is going on, but they're suspicious of why this plane is landing there. So they take his gun and they take his paperwork, the Japanese pilot. Then they bring in these three Japanese, this one old man who was a beekeeper. And he, and they ask him to interpret. He turned pale and left. They bring in a couple and the couple didn't tell the truth about what the Japanese pilot was saying to the Hawaiians on the island. Now there's more to the story, but the Japanese pilot ended up holding the island prisoners. He took the guns out of his out of his um, airplane. He was shooting up the town with these two Japanese, and then the third one get on the island. Until Ben Kanahele was told, "You be in charge." The, all the island men, the women ran away. I, the island men, said, "We're going to row over." Ben, you're in charge. Ben was the biggest man on the island. You're in charge. Protect everybody. Well, so Ben's standing there. He and his wife, Ella, are standing there, and they're looking at the Japanese pilot, and he's looking like he's getting kind of tired. And he says to the other Japanese, get his gun. You're done. Get his gun. Well, the Japanese guy goes for the gun, but the pilot, who's a trained soldier, of course, snaps too, and he gets really mad, and he says, I'm going to start killing people, and I'm going to start with you. And he shoots Ben Conahaley three times. Well, that kind of irritated the tall man, Ben Conahaley. <laughs> so he picked him up and he threw him against a, a wall, you know, a sheep wall. He was a shepherd. And anyway, his wife hits him with a rock. Ella hits him with a rock. Well, Ben was a war hero, obviously, after that. But it didn't come out till later what he had done. So I'm standing next to this <laughs> big lion. And I said, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going on. And this young kid's looking at me and he goes, you know, I've been on this boat for 10 years and nobody has known the story about Niihau. And the man you're talking about was my great grandfather. So there I was telling Christian Conahaley about his grandfather's story that of course he knew way more about than I did. But do you see what I mean? Providence puts me with these people. Yes. It's just bizarre. It's just bizarre how I get this information. And listen to me. If you if you ever are wearing a World War II hat and I'm around, I will chase you down <laughs> and ask you if I can interview you. I will chase you on the ferry, Costco. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> if I see you, I'm after you. And that's how I found the majority of my people that I've interviewed. 
But you know, there's we had a there was a lot of Japanese spies in America, and this is the truth. It's a fact. There was one in particular. He landed this one. Well, look, Yamamoto himself um, was at Harvard. He worked in Washington, D.C. as an attache to our Navy in 19, was it 21? So, I mean, you know, he, he had the wherewithal. Of course, so if we have a spy at Harvard, we better have one at Stanford. There was one at Stanford trying to get information, elicit some of our yeomen, our U.S. Navy yeomen, um, to provide information. They were well organized as the Japanese were, and they were sending information back through the consulates. Now, we couldn't go on to consulates, and the consulates were sending requests for the type of information that they wanted to, there's, there's actual communications from Tokyo to Seattle, to a, a Sato in Seattle, to LA, to DC. You, so mm -hmm. uh, this is what we want you to do. Find us this information. So you see, and then they would write back and say, yes, a battleship just came in um, up at Bremerton. It looked like this, it looked like that, you know, it, it, it was a supply ship. So there was a lot of information that was going back and forth be, uh, from, from shore to shore. So, um, but there was one man in particular that was on Oahu. He landed March of 19, March 27th of 1941, March to December. Wow. That was it. And he collected so much information and he sent it back. And um, unfortunately, he was working at the consulate and we believed him and we ended up sending him back. And then he was working for this there, you know, high up in their secret service over in in Tokyo. We exchanged him on the grip show. Um, but there was there was a lot of activity that was going on. Every country was doing it. But um, so there really was a lot, a lot of information to be found about the process that led up to World War II and how blindsided we were, or were we really blindsided? Um, the, the, the reasoning for the relocation camps of the Japanese to get them away from the shorelines. Did you know that from December 7th to the end of that month of 1941, to the end of that month alone, there was eight Japanese submarines going up and down the West Coast and five Americans were killed by wow. those submarines. Wow. They were sinking every ship they could find because they didn't want any supplies to go back to Hawaii to rebuild. Gas, lumber, and oil, I mean, lumber, any of that was, they didn't want it shipped back. So they were sinking big, huge cargo ships. So wow. that was their job. They were positioned from Alaska down to the Mexico shore and they would just sit and wait. And then when they saw a ship, they'd go and sink them. And there was another big surprise at the end of De on December on Christmas Day, but they got pulled back. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it is interesting because you go through a lot of this in the book in a really creative storyline and it gets intense at times. I mean, the, the characters are in the thick of it and I love it. I, it was really engaging. Um, to read about. And like I said, I never read about these parts of history before, and especially the war in the Pacific Northwest, which makes a lot of sense why it should be a big focal point since we're so close to those areas, right? We got Hawaii in, the, in between, and and yet we don't hear a lot about what happened in America at those times. And I, I think we hear a lot about California, but definitely not up here in Washington and Oregon. Like I didn't grow up hearing anything about those. And we, we focus a lot on about Europe and very little about our own country. And we hear all the negative parts of what we did, but we don't hear the whys sometimes. And I think that's very important to understand the clearer picture, no matter what you feel about what we did, you have to have the full picture and nobody did completely right in war. Nobody ever will do completely right in war. It's war and split second decisions have to be made and decisions you have to decide whether something's valid or not valid very quickly. And I, I just love reading about it and reading about 
I think the war stands out to me so much because it was such a time when there was such darkness and yet there were such heroes and everyday people were becoming heroic or they were becoming totally evil. Like it was like a split and it's, it's, it's fascinating human nature study to study world war II, And then just to know that everybody just shut the door on it and stopped talking about it for years and years and years. We knew the worst. We knew what happened to the Jews that was really focused upon. um, And some of the atrocities that Hitler did, but we didn't know. And we knew about what we did. You know, I don't know about right after, but when, at least when I was going through, we knew about the bombs that we dropped on Japan and uh, you know, the, the horrors of that, but there wasn't this everyday people story. Well, you know that there's, when you really do dig into this, the, one of the, one of the men I interviewed was a professor at Seattle university, uh, Bob Harmon. He loved my books. He says, boy, did she do her research, but, and he's no longer with us. God bless him. But, um, he's all right. Here's, here's, here's one situation. There's several, the, the bomb, Hiroshima. Um, first of all, we did more damage with our fire bombs every night. The Japanese did what people do in war. They built their factories with homes all the way around it. And those homes in Japan were made paper or wood. Mm-hmm. They were so flammable. So at night we would go in and we would do fire bombing. Many more of the Japanese civilians died during the fire bombing than they did it in mm-hmm. those two other bombs oh. but also they were not giving up remember um the emperor had to hide when he made the recording saying i'm surrendering he had to hide the recording and, and he had to have his own men his private guards protect him because they were coming to kill him so he couldn't surrender they did not want him to to surrender at all um but the our men our young men who had gone in, let's, let, I'm going to use Bob Harmon, Professor Bob yeah. Harmon, as an example. Now, he went through the Battle of the Bulge, the winter of mm. 44, probably the, the worst, 45, 44, 45, the worst winter. Um, and, you know, sleeping in the snow, the coldest, one of the coldest they'd had on record. People were freezing to death, et cetera, et cetera. And, but he didn't have enough points. You see, he went in late. And you had to have enough points. So he was in line after fighting the Germans to go fight the Japanese. Wow. And a lot of our men were like, no way. You know, I'm, I don't want to, <laughs> uh, the Germans were bad enough. I and mean, I've heard about the Japanese. I do not want to go fight them. And w- there was a lot of um, a lot of men that would have it would have been a mess. It really would have been a mess. Now, I interviewed a Japanese man who was taken into their army, Japanese army. He was in Japan, obviously. Japanese army, I was he nine or 10? And he was about wow. 12 at this point in time. And I asked him, I said, Mike, so um, the army fed you? No. Did they give you bar- barracks or? No. Well, where did you sleep? And he said, anywhere I can. But he was expected to defend his country at his age. And he wow. told me that he was given matches And what little fuel they had left, they were putting in barrels along the um, shoreline. And they were told the minute they saw white men, they were the kids were supposed to go down and light the barrels and not worry about a thing. Oh, they didn't care if they were going to blow up the children. These are the Japanese. They didn't care. They just, I mean, so it was, and then on the other side, I interviewed a man who was one of the very first ones to sleep on the beach in Japan you know, when they were offloading and he, he and a few of his um, other uh, sailors were told, here, you're going to sleep on the beach tonight. And they're like, oh, really? But in the morning, when the Japanese came, they were friendly. You know, they were handing them food and, you know, they didn't, they had nothing. Remember, mm. after the fire bombings, they were starving. The people in the countryside were doing better because they had food. But right. the you know, they were torching those shores, you know, so it it was mass destruction. And that's when we came in to rebuild. And ironically, there was a, there was a, there was actual spy schools in Japan, Nakano or Nakano. 
had one and they um they decided in 1937 they needed more spies so they 2500 they produced before the end of the war and they were intelligent and they wore their hair long and suits and they were the highest in jujitsu and every martial art you can think of and they had little you know they there was another section that was made just for spy gear as you can well imagine um but it was these very people who were, were the head of of the spy rings i read in one of the books that, that i was reading that were enlisted to help redevelop japan wow so here they went from being you know well they were in the know of course mm -hmm. but they were also on the forefront then um and probably knew the wherewithal to to help the united states that's um, incredible and it, it's incredible how that adversity that we had it just changed and they became one of our allies you know and, and we work it was so wonderful it, it's and it is a beautiful culture and it was tainted just like the german culture was beautiful and it was tainted right. um right. and how one bad leader can change things and cause it's, great it's, harm uh, to the not only their own country but to the world to the world it truly was a, i'm glad you said this earlier it truly was a world war in june and july of 1944 I, you know i want to get a globe and i want to just have it light up where all of these incidences were happening yeah. all of these battles you know burma australia you, you know hawaii all over just all over if you if it lit up where people were going to to battle and you know people from different countries were coming together it would the globe would be a ball yeah. of light yeah. because it truly truly was um world war a global a world war it was not as isolated as the situations are that we're up against right now that could quickly spread right but it, at that point in time it was rightfully named World War. And the start of it for us was, well, not the start, but the big turning point for us was this battle in Hawaii and the attack Pearl on Harbor. Hawaii. And it's, if you've ever been there and you stood on that, it's like a, I don't know, I want to say it's like a dock, but I went out there once. It is a solemn thing just they were so caught off guard they were so innocent and like you said they were off at one o'clock to go be on recreation i mean to be in hawaii was like the dream position yeah. you know and they went there to relax and the absolute attack and the absolute slaughter with no i mean there was more i won't get too much into it because you cover it so well in the book but yeah and remember and it was a sunday and that's what the japanese always did they're historically if you look back through the centuries and centuries they they'll they'll attack on a sunday or a holiday interesting interesting mm -hmm. that's their that's their most so you know and we we did have warnings we did have we warnings. Did. that's why i didn't want to give too much away no, there were no, warnings, we're not, but, not um, talking about it Read the, books. <laughs> Read the book. They're fascinating books. And Denise, as you can't tell, is a wonderful storyteller. And what she does orally is one thing, but her writing is phenomenal. Her character development, her ability to put you in that location. And I think it comes from the fact that not only did she research, but she did take the time. She went there, she saw, and she's able to describe the scenery and the scene so perfectly. I, I want to talk just briefly. We have just a few moments left because so many authors say this and I haven't experienced it yet, probably because I haven't taken out, I wouldn't say it's pen and paper, but that's not what we do anymore. I haven't pulled out the typewriter to start writing my books yet. I have characters that come to me at night when I'm trying to sleep and I can write books in my head, but putting on paper, tell me a little bit of what that experience is like having a character talk to you and tell you what to say. I know what it's like when I'm laying in bed thinking, and it just runs more like a movie, but what is it like for you? Because I hear many authors say it. Well, it's, you know, you're in your groove when it's happening because this is not about you. It's about them. So you really have to, you know, like when you're directing, you have to pull back and let the other actors create the image off of that you've created on the paper. But I don't, I don't write every day. Some people say, oh, you have to write. No. I can't do it. You know, my head is too full. 
I will, I like to write for four hours a day because otherwise I'm spinning. I really watch myself on going down rabbit holes on the research. However, if I need it, I will spend three hours to write one sentence to make sure I have it right. You know, doing the research. If I right. can't find it, I'm digging, digging, digging. Uh, but um, when the characters get going, it flows so fast. And I'm not afraid to put in dialogue because I think when a character is delivering the line the way it should be delivered, then you you get more of an insight instead of it being a flat screen. It it just, it creates it more. But another trick I like is I like to leave um, at, a, at an exciting point or write the first two lines for the next day or the next time I'm going to write. That way I'm itching to get back. I know nice. basically where I'm going to start. So I'm not like, oh, I don't want to go right today because I don't know what I'm doing. But it does help. It just helps you. And if you don't use it, big deal. At least you've been lured back to put your Ocole <laughs> on the chair. That's the hardest part is to yeah. get in front of your pen and paper, typewriter, computer, whatever modem you want to use. You know, and that's the hardest part is sitting down. <laughs> and so if that's what lures you in, use it. And and you know what? Be careful. Don't let other people tell you, oh, this is wrong or this is wrong. Do it all the way through and then let them and let yourself because you're going to be your own worst enemy on this. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you're gonna, oh, I have to rewrite it. Well, if you keep doing that, you're never going to get your book done. Get your book done. You have years to edit it. So I like that. That's good advice. And um yeah, I can I can see how that process would work. Because yeah, I, I saw I saw I saw it churning over there. I saw it. <laughs> just get it down. You know, you'd be surprised. Well, and I yeah, because as a reader, you kind of want to stop when you have to stop. You want to stop at an exciting part because it will lure you back in the next day, right? And it was interesting to hear that that's the same process for an author. If you want to really be excited about writing, stop at an exciting part and come back to it. And I'm thinking about that for people that suffer writer's block or they get stuck in the story. That's a really fascinating way to maybe keep pushing yourself on. And so when you get stuck in the story, do you just stop and walk away for a while until it comes comes to you? What do you do? I, I will do that. I will do that. Because if you push too hard, you know, it's it you're you're forcing something. They're not happy with you. The characters are obviously a little irritated with you if they're not talking. <laughs> And you're doing something wrong. So I will, I will allow myself to step back. You know, you have to have grace on yourself too, because the world is hectic right now. Yeah. And, you know, you just, you know, but you have to have a quiet space. You have to set that up and everyone develops their own style of when they write what they, what they like to do. But yes, I, um, for example, the, the ending actually, I knew what I wanted, but I didn't know what I wanted if you see the difference yep. and it came to me in a dream and I'm like, well, where have I been? You know? And so I, when I was just this last time, when I was just in Hanapepe a couple of weeks ago, cause I had a book signing over there nice. and um, yeah, thank you. And when I was there and I, and I had already formulated in my mind, the ending ending, I thought, okay, great. And so I was able to do even more research for what I needed on Oahu and, and Hanapepe. So, because the the islands were, remember the president didn't want to, our president did not want to fire the first shot. So he was waiting for Japan to fire at us. <laughs> and, you know, and, that, and that's why when it happened with, but it happened, it far exceeded anyone's anticipation of a Japan attacking us yeah. first. You know, they just didn't think it would be that bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it um, was. It was. It was horrendous. And just from being there and sensing, you can sense it when you're there, when you're at on Oahu and you're looking at the tribute, it, it you can feel it. And you can it's very spiritual. It's a it very is. everyone everyone should do it to be reminded of the atrocities of war and the importance of our democracy and the freedom that we enjoy and what it took to give us that. Yes, I you agree. Know. And they truly were the greatest generation that went through World War II and what they sacrificed, men, women, and children. I mean, everybody sacrificed something 
whether they participate in the war. I mean, we had rationing, we had everything. It just created a generation that was incredible and was willing to give so much. And they wanted and to they go did. over and defend. They wanted to defend freedom and they went. And I just love it. Um, my grandfather did not fight in World War II because he had severe back problems. And he was, my grandfather was, a my great grandfather was a farmer and he was his assistant. There was more than one son. His brother did go and fight, but he did not. He stayed back on the farm. Um, but, but that was an important job. It was an important job. Very important job. Food. And, and I, it, it's interesting to me because when I look at my own family history, so his cousins, my family's all from Sweden. You can't really tell it, but my mom's family's all Swedish and um, my grandfather's full Swede. And they all landed in my hometown in Illinois and they stayed so closely bonded. And after World War II, so my grandfather was raised with all of his first cousins around. They were like best friends all the way through their lives because they all stayed in Illinois. And it was interesting that my there's a family reunion for that. And it's 75 years going strong. They started it after the war. So do I have my years right? Maybe it's long. I think we just did our 75th. And all the cousins decided after the war, they wanted to make this an annual tradition because they were separated for so long during the war that they would bring, everybody would come home. And there were 12 children in that the original family and it was all their descendants. And we still get together today. And it started because of that, because of the war. They were wanting to Beautiful. rebond and bu rebuild after the war. And I never heard them once in all those years growing up talk about the war years at that reunion. It was so ignored. And I'm so saddened because they're all gone now. That generation's yeah. all gone. Um, and they're, I can't ask them, but I have some of the pictures. I've, I've you know, got some of the things, but even their wives and their, they became nurses during that time and were were serving too and doing their own things. So I think it's a fascinating time of history and one that we hope never gets repeated, but we have to be careful. And our, our world right now is very unstable and we have to be smart. And I think it's so important. And I think it's so interesting that the world became more unstable right as all this influx of World War II stories are being uncovered and told for the first time. Um, and I think it's very important that we read those stories and we, we make sure that we honor those that served and we glean from their characters, what we need to glean. I always wondered, I always read World War II stories and thought, especially in Europe, where would I have been? What would I have done? How would I have treated people? Would I have been one of the ones that sat and covered my eyes to protect, protect my family or would I risk it all to help someone? I know what I want to say, but it's hard to judge in the moment what people went through and the, the decisions they had to make and the humanity that we, we can see unfold in a good story. And so thank you, Denise. I appreciate your time so much. Um, I always oh, love talking to Denise. What she shared with us is so teeny tiny compared to the knowledge she has on the subject, but I really encourage you to read the two books and I'm going to put pressure on her. Denise, when's that third one? When can we, when, when can we anticipate it? Are I am hoping. Yeah, probably. I'll tell you why. Uh, remember the, the reason for these, the pauses in between is not that I'm not trying to write. It's if I find anyone who is of that era, that is a World War II vet that is still alive. I, I have to drop everything and go because I can't tell you how many times I have had an interview. And the night before I get a call from the daughter, it says, I'm sorry, he passed last night, you know, or he's in the hospital now and you can't reach him. So, I mean, it, it's a, it's, it's a time, time frame for me. So, um, but it's opening up and I'm working very hard on it and I'm working a lot on it and I, I really want it done too. I'm excited to know what Billy's going to tell me to do. <laughs> We kind of know how the war is going to end, but we don't know, know all the details and facts that you're going to exactly. bring out. And, and there's, a, the there's a lot, there's a lot going on. And those characters, I, read, are, I have all of these characters. Yes. And they know? are very, very, a, very engaging. Brother, you know? Yeah. And well, I, thank you. I'm trying thank to remember the family. There's the, it's Jack's family. Um, 
and there's a lot the of different Huntington's, things. Huntington's, they're in, they're in yes. San Francisco. And then there's Billy's family that's in Seattle. Her brother, Eddie, is overseas now. Yep. You remember? Yep. See, so I have, I, the, the beauty of it was interviewing men and women from veterans from both theaters. Yep. I, in, in book books two and three, I have my characters in both theaters. So I'm covering both theaters and you're learning history, um, not only on Europe, which we have had a lot of exposure to. You were right about that but a lot about the Pacific as well. Wow, I am so excited. And I'm so excited once you finish the book to start working on the World War II and putting the, the actual stories up, the interviews up, because I that's such an important obligation you have. I'll now. let you know. I'll let you know when book three's out and I'll let you know when the interviews start going up. Absolutely. And when book three's out, I'd love to have you back on and interview I, again. Yeah, I'm there. You got it. It'd be great fun. So thank you, Denise. We appreciate it. We love hearing the story behind the story. And we love and appreciate these authors that put so much time and effort into publishing these books. And now it's our responsibility to carry their stories forward and make sure people know about them and hear about them because they do not have huge ad agencies behind them. So thank you, Denise. And we will get this interview up and please, please, please go and, and purchase our books. You can find it at Discover Books and many other places. So thank you and have a great night.